Hello, everyone. Uh, Hello. Welcome to this amazing panel. Um, my name is Andrea Camargo. Um, I'm really passionate about technology, nature, uh, yoga, and my mindfulness. Um, I studied veterinary medicine in Colombia. I'm from Colombia. Um, and then I did a master's degree in Silicon Valley on uh, international business and innovation. And there is where all this biological world and this technological world started to mix. Um, and it's a pleasure to be here with you all. Um, definitely Web3 and AI can be powerful tools uh, to shift our collective potential towards different scenarios. It all depends on how we use it. And today we have uh, you guys, exceptional panelists uh, here with us. Um, I will be moderating this very intriguing conversation about trust, innovation, collaboration, and also uh, risk involving uh, the use of emerging technologies. So let's start by presenting ourselves uh, with a quick introduction of your personal and professional experience. Um, let's begin with Anil. Hi, everyone. Good evening from Frankfurt. Uh, Germany, and um, I'm the co-founder of TurboSlow Web3 Agency. We create uh, new media projects uh, using uh, AI, AR, XR, and blockchain technologies, uh, Web3 technologies, basically, uh, in a very diverse wide fields. And I mean, um, from wellness to gaming, and <laughs> from fashion to art. Uh, uh, and we work with the artists, AI artists too. We are actually uh, organizing an AI exhibition at the moment uh, with um, many different artists from all over the world. And uh, I'm also a creator in the field. So, and uh, I'm into wellness and digital technology, mindful technology mostly. Uh, I work with the kids and parents and plus uh i'm also uh, i mean uh, i love to do like things like ai meditation metaverse meditation make it a bit we're working with the words like mantraverse or intraverse <laughs> or things like that and uh, i'm also co-founder of uh, crypto female germany and a voice for the women empowerment uh, women in web3 and uh yeah very happy to be here tonight this evening Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, Richard, do you want to go? Oh, you're yeah, muted. Yeah, we can Richard. Yeah. Sorry about that. Uh, yes, yeah, so my name is Richard Bukowski. Uh, I am a... Um, so, excuse me, future um, forecaster and futurist. Um, the um, I've been in the um, uh, two decades of experience in marketing and digital marketing. Uh, I specialize in forecasting trends and developing um, innovative strategies to help leaders uh, uh, and and group leaders position their uh, companies both with a predictable and a more you know, positive uh, future. Uh, kind of at its core, I help my clients imagine different futures so they can develop um, you know, actionable and again, optimistic plans to future-proof uh, their businesses. The, um, uh, I have, uh, I consider myself more of a multidisciplinarian when it comes to my um, futures. Um, because there are, as we all know, different um, industries touch other industries. And then as we continue to you know, emerge, they continue to also branch off into different directions. So I like to bring a very kind of holistic and uh, kind of wide ranging uh, experiences to you know, today's current problems. Awesome, thank you, Richard. Um, Jonas? Sure. Yeah, nice to meet you all. Um, I'm Jonas, originally from um, Germany as well. Um, now, nowadays, more all over the place. Um, back in the days, I started uh, with studying uh, mechanical engineering. So from a completely, not completely, but 
a slightly different world. Um, and then during my studies, I uh, realized that I would like to follow this um, entrepreneurial path. Um, and um, I was also very interested in Web3. Um, so I got into Web3, um, yeah, 2017, 2018, um, where I really uh, wanted to understand the technology and uh, deep dive into, it, into that, which led me then to basically um, study blockchain technologies. So I got a master's degree in that. Um, and during that time, I yeah, dived into different um, crypto communities, Web3 communities, um, and also founded my first company there. Um, which was basically a fully licensed um, crypto on and off ramp in a fully non-custodial way. Um, so a lot of <laughs> technical um, phrases here, but yeah, that's basically what it was um, out of Europe. Um, then I uh, founded a second company, which was more like an um, infrastructure provider for um, decentralized finance, um, DeFi. And yeah, um, as of now, I'm, I'm funding, um, funding another company, which is Trustbyte. And um, yeah, I really was happy about um, the title of this panel today because um, that's exactly what we are doing. So we are basically bringing both worlds together here. Um, it's all about uh, basically increasing the trust. So um, in particular, um, increasing the trust in, in protocols, in Web3 in general. And for that, we are um, applying AI. So really bringing both um, tech stacks here together and that's why I'm really looking forward to, to our panel today. And yeah, may our gather be well. Awesome, Jonas. Thank you so much. Um, very diverse backgrounds we have here. Uh, Daniel, uh, you go. All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Daniel. So I'm the co-founder of the SciTech VR. At SciTech VR, we are doing the virtual reality therapy for the mental health and wellness. And as a pioneers, we integrated the artificial intelligence, the generative AI, in the process of treating a variety of different disorders. Um, I have in my family, I have three generations of psychologists, so I'm quite in the field. And nowadays, we have, we, we really help people with the AI and a combination of the VR, which is a part of the web free. So that makes this, you know, more juicy for this discussion. Also, I'm in the VR for the past five years. <clears throat> Love to share some insights today. And uh, all of you have a great experience. And Andrea, you also mentioned the mindfulness, which is a uh, kind of very relevant for me. Uh, great to be here. Thank you. Awesome. Great to be here as well. Um... There are a lot of questions here, but um, I will guide the questions for uh, some of you. Uh, this one specifically um, will be for Richard and Daniel. So how do you think Web3 and AI can be used collaboratively for humanitarian purposes? Um, I'll go first. Well, the um, you know, as a futurist, we always look, you know, five, 10 years into, you know, into the future, but we base everything on that on what's currently going on. And so um, I'm very familiar with how, uh, let's just say, you know, I guess Web3 um, as an incorporating to AI is already going on. So there are, you know, tons of um, sensors uh, around the planet measuring, you know, uh, sea water, you know, sea temperature, uh, you know, wave sizes, all number of things like that, that are kind of going into a centralized kind of database and then, you know, allowing uh, everyone to know if there's any dangers, things to kind of, you know, work out. Uh, that, I, pre I uh, predict that uh, the sensors will start going, you know, smaller. So that we'll start, you know, very similar to uh, kind of the tags uh, and then, you know, individually tagged. So we'll be able to know, again, some either, you know, detailed information about your personal health or things like that kind of going on. Uh, the other uh, main, uh, at least when it comes to AI, is how the um, some medical fields and research are using it. So uh, there are for you know additional diagnoses. So we're very familiar with on how X-ray, X-ray, and heart technicians are using you know or at least uh, double checking AI just in case they kind of miss something. But geneticists worldwide are using this uh, with um, AI uh, algorithms that can recognize up to 300 disorders just based on the patient's face um, and be able to 
you know, uh, again, make, uh, you know, or, um, you know, help how certain, um, you know, um, drugs are being developed and uh, kind of current uses you know, for them. So, uh, you know, my hope is uh, that it will continue to grow exponentially because we're no longer following Moore's law. And with unlimited storage, you know, uh, you know, positive information, you know, given for free for, you know, doctors and other researchers and stuff to use, uh, will, uh, you know, I would say would con continue to go down into deeper directions. Yes, definitely this um, field, I mean, the health of our planet, the health of ourselves can be influenced by the technology we are creating. And um, we will talk about those risks as well a bit later, but um, from what I studied, the, the biotech can go in uh, different directions, right? It can go to cure disease, but it can go and create a new virus or a new disease that we don't know about. Um, but it's it's really interesting perspective. Thank you, Richard. Um, Daniel. Yeah, I have something to share. Uh, I would like to come with more practical oriented thing here. So because we know that as a humanity, different humanitarian things like like mental health support and mental trauma recovery is one of it. I would like to go to the side of the site tech where we help people with the mental health and wellness. So um, I can give you an example. Like, like there is a cognitive behavioral therapy, which is approved by the World Health Organization. Everyone knows this. And CBT therapists, they use an emotional exposure when they're trying to expose the patient to a certain anxiety disorder. But everyone knows that people with a trauma, they have issues visualizing a certain experience, an exposure environment. So here, where VR can help. But during the exposure therapy, it's really necessary to bring a patient from the exposure to the safe place if a panic attack happens. So this is where we're bringing the generative AI for creating any relaxative practice. So the patient can go and create a certain, let's say, a mountain trail with the ships or a green forest within a sky and with the gen AI can create a certain relaxative space. And this is where the VR can help, can help because the patient don't need to visualize it with the imagination. The patient here can see the exposure therapy, the VR exposure therapy. And on the other hand, we have a safe place AI. And there is an easy, you know, transition between these places. So for example, in terms of the therapy, this is how the VR and gen AI can help. I can give you another example. So for example, the AI companion. So social phobia is something very, it's in the air. So it's, 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 it's very common, especially after the COVID. So a lot of people even don't know how to interact with the colleagues in the office. So the AI here can help in terms of the avatars and companions. And we're actually working on one of the system. So you can take, even if you work with a Unity Unreal, you can take a 3D person there and uh, like like power up with the gen a uh, sorry with the ai like a chat gpt or any other available right now and uh, this can be the ai companion so you can integrate it to the vr and have a you know like a certain um social phobia and different type of the training and the beauty here is that the therapist is no longer creating scripts for the therapy, but more of like supervising and looking for this from the perspective of the research of how the patient is working with the social avatar, AI powered avatar, right? So here comes more space and time where the therapist can spectate and can research on the behavioral of the patient. So I mean, like, yeah, de definitely in the therapy. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I did so a bit of um, what you are creating with uh, SciTech. It's very, mm -hmm. very interesting to, to merge these um, technologies with mental health. I think it has a great potential. And um, I've used it myself, you know, when I was studying abroad and my partner was in Colombia, I used to ask ChatGPT like, oh, uh, can you give me advice on how to maintain a long distance relationship? And it actually uh, gave me good ideas, you know? It's not uh, like it's going to uh, be your only friend or something, but it definitely can make you uh, go into other neural pathways, let's say. 
Um, so thank you, Daniel. Maybe Anil, you want to uh, comment on this as well? Yeah, I was I was just thinking, why don't you just ask a friend other than ChatGPT? So, uh, but it is like a friend, right? Sometimes. So when you feel alone, because I've I've been expat, I mean, all my life, and uh, uh, still my family lives in another city in another country. So when I feel alone, and some of my friends are all over the world so it's not easy to to find them just in at that time uh, because one of them is in australia my best friend so <laughs> i can't just ask her just just like that sometimes it's like those are like robots also <laughs> kind of some of them are talking some of them are not talking and they're just you know um and, i mean can type you uh, but could be an interesting friend from time to time to get some, um, yeah, uh, that kind of recommendations. Especially I'm using it for my son because I have only one son and uh, he's, he's, he's not a lonely child, but he loves to talk a lot. So he is using a lot about those robots and chat GPTs and Alexa things. He, he just loves it. And we can't just, I, I mean, stop him. <laughs> it's uh, it's like a friend to him, and I think it's uh, it's really cool sometimes. <laughs> yes, definitely. From a from a it um, like one personal story, um, a quick one um, regarding, especially like applying uh, AI to maybe rather psychological problems or like cases. Um, a few years back, I came back from a, a longer journey living like abroad in Asia for um, nine or 10 months. And um, I came back and I felt something was, was different. So um, I used to uh, basically live um, with my parents back then, so, but something has changed. And um, I didn't really know what it was and uh, it really affected my, my energy levels. Um, I was constantly tired um, and I felt something is definitely wrong. I went to the doctor and um, checked everything, like from the um, physical, um, physical health, everything was um, totally fine. Um, until a friend like told me, yeah, maybe with your psych psychology is something wrong and you really should consider to talk to a therapist. And for me, that was back then, um, never uh, affected by like uh, psychological problems or um, something like that. Um, that was a huge step to to go out to expose myself to a therapist. And um, nowadays, I see more and more applications, especially with AI, where basically you can have like a first chat. And I feel like this is like a crucial step because it's like this psychological barrier um, to even start to talk about it. Um, and that, for example, would have definitely helped me back then. Um, if I would have known like a tool where I can just chat, explain my, my situation, explain my, um, my problems, um, and then um, maybe uh, talk to a therapist after that. Yes, definitely. And I think this is something that we are seeing more and more often, even with young children uh, that can be more open towards these um, AI chats than even to other people. Um, and that is kind of, um, how can I say, um, a double-sided coin because uh, from one perspective, you can see that uh, the social connection may be a bit um, lost, but in other ways, um, young children are entering to this gaming world and they are connecting not only with robots, but other people around the world. So it's really interesting how this is going to shift um, our communication in the future. Um, but also something really, really uh, important to think about is um, if we are talking with these uh, machines and these are gathering all the data in a centralized uh, network, um, what are the challenges uh, around the trust and the security of these data? And I think, Jonas, uh, maybe you can start with this question and then Richard or someone can jump in. Sure. Uh, thanks a lot. Um, yeah, where should I start? I mean, how, how much time do I have? <laughs> no, just kidding. Um, challenges, I mean, 
there are massive challenges, period. Um, maybe we, we can um, separate into both technologies like Web3 and AI. Um, Web3, um, in my opinion, is definitely the, the trust factor. So when we look at Web3 today, um, it's very it's a very scattered environment. So we have like um, like more and more <clears throat> applications of um, Web3 or crypto or whatever you want to call it. Um, also like in, in the institutional world. Um, I mean, just a couple of weeks ago, um, we all know it, the Bitcoin ETF was approved. Um, but on the other hand, we have like so many projects going on um, that are like completely, um, of course, not, not regulated on the one hand side, but also um, they are completely operating somehow in the dark um, behind the curtain, um, especially for the majority of people. So um, in order to, to really um, generate the, the trust for Web3, um, we need on the one hand side, like um, um, rock solid like uh, technologies and uh, security. Um, but on the, on the other hand, we basically need to educate the people and we made, need to make it um, way more easier to interact with Web3. Um, so especially from the security side, I see massive challenges and this um, the security um, directly affects also like the, the regulations um, around Web3. So if we look like um, I just read the news uh, a couple of uh, hours ago, there was like a massive hack going on. And so um, apparently Ripple was exploited. Um, and talking about Ripple, I mean, um, they basically won a case in the US against the SEC, right? Um, so these are like like huge challenges, especially for, for Web3. Um, so we definitely need to increase the security. We need to stop. I mean, you can't stop the hacks and exploits, but we need to um, fight against these. Um, and that's why um, we are working with Trustbytes um, on that. And so this is like one of the main reasons why uh, we basically start Trustbytes. On the AI part, it's like, um, I would assume uh, that we don't even know all the, all the challenges and uh, threat factors here. Because like um, this, this technology is like just evolving so super fast um, and we can just um, slightly imagine what kind of um, threats uh, um, there will be in the, in the upcoming years. But of course, we, we already see like um, threats by, by deepfakes, obviously, by a prompt injection, um, by um, AI models that are trained um, in a harmful way. Um, so either with uh, wrong data or harmful data. Um, I mean, uh, I think it was last year when we had this um, deep um, fake from, from Joe Biden, where um, apparently this deep fake called a lot of people. Um, so there are definitely massive uh, challenges. And um, I think um, the, the trust factor um, is like de definitely one of the main uh, challenges here. Um, and we need to see, and we also need to uh, keep on developing the technology uh, in order to, to fight those threats. Yes, I, I think this has always been like um, a challenge in all the technology we have been creating for the past decades. Like when we started using the internet, we also had uh, deep fakes and uh, scams and all these um, like fake uh, news and, you know, this disruption of, of um, security that we had. Uh, we also have it now, of course, with more powerful tools. Mm. But I, I think we also have this um, other side that is building that um, uh, trust and that safety around the technology. So it's always well, just one, yeah, just one yeah. difference. The entry um, barrier is way lower. So the the uh, entry barrier for for people who want to start to to um, hack or who want to start uh, to do those threats is way lower with the um, recent development in, in AI. Right. I guess all these low code, no code um, tools are also uh, opening up these doors for all kinds of people to do um, amazing and horrible things at the same time. Um, yeah. 
Richard, do you want to comment on this one? Oh, yes, definitely would love to. Uh, well, uh, the one thing we all know, and again, uh, you know, trust is earned and not given. So it really, most companies and let's, let's say, com uh, let's say governments, you know, we'll have to put in the long, you know, the long game to get that to happen. And as you mentioned, you know, we were very worried about in web point, uh, one, you know, we were worried about putting credit card information into the web, you know, we're pretty confident about that, you know. Uh, you know, so where, um, you know, in web two, uh, and actually it's kind of take it you know, a little further, uh, we learned in the, um, um, uh, Edelman trust barrier, barrier of 2023 that actually, uh, you know, businesses actually had a higher trust level than the media and the government and the NGOs. Now, again, that's a year ago. <laughs> a lot has kind of happened here, but, you know, it would be good for businesses to take advantage, you know, of that opportunity. And what we heard coming out of Davos, uh, you know, this season was mainly about trust. You know, where is it? How do we get it? How do we keep it? You know, there's been a complete breakdown. You know, is it more political than it is anything? So I, that's why I forecast, you know, businesses might have a better chance of, you know, building platforms and, um that will have a little bit you know of a, a chance uh to uh continue you know that long game and in marketing you know we've been doing <clears throat> excuse me uh different aspects of wide range um you know uh, reach you know measurement and such so also coming out of web one and web two where uh you know we we may have or again a forecast something that is considered always on now, I think we're always on anyway uh, when it comes to our uh, home assistance, listening devices, you know, uh, kind of, you know, where, you know, kind of where else you want to, you know, get kind of giving your information already. And, um, and especially going back to, again, um, trying to gain trust. But then, um, you know, how do you do that is, you know, uh, culturally is kind of at home. So I had... Um, Going back to what we mentioned before about, you know, using AI for diagnoses and other in, in digital collection. So uh, if we can imagine a, um, a, um, a very smart glasses, right? not visors or something. This is something that would, you know, literally have to go out every day or something like that. And uh, with some just basic information, uh, you know, as we all go to our eye doctor, you know, you can have... Um, you know, again, health problems solved, you know, ca catching health problems with simple eye exams, like brain, you know, brain tumors, diabetes, uh, as we mentioned before, even lupus, um, all can be uh, detected quickly and, and easily just by some like simple, again, scanning. So we can put that on. Same thing with the voice before I'm a very big voice person, you know, you're a learned uh, platform could tell the difference in your everyday life uh, from your menstrual cycle to if you're pregnant to um, other vocal biomarkers like lead poisoning and kind of a few other kind of surprise things that you didn't know that your voice can give it to you. And a lot of that, even, you know, we were addressing some of the um, health, re you know, the, I'm sorry, mental health, you know, which we all need to be putting, you know, a full attention on. Your device, once it knows you, could tell if your tonality is all different. You know, you're not feeling, you know, you're not yourself or you're not something like that. Now, going back into the trust, this all has to be captured all the time, you know, all the time, putting someplace, you know, where am I, you know, again, where is that going? You know, how, you know, how is it being read? Is anyone else reading it? Things like that. Again, that's where the trust needs to happen. I think some, you know, again, non-government or third party could do a good job, you know, with that. And then once, you know, you start to, you know, not only will it help you, you know, find the, you know, your office or kind of things like that, but then also if, you know, your kind of day-to-day -day things and once your day-to-day, -day th you know, um, issues are being addressed, I would trust you and I'll continue to move forward. Really interesting, uh, Richard. And I, I think that this, um, especially decentralization, that comes uh, from Web3 technologies can um, really create different types of governance. 
in the business level, in the government level, and uh, as a society. And that, I think, will uh, change our trust between um, the platforms we use, the social media uh, companies we use, the um, uh, search engines we use, like if that centralization uh, starts to create new governance structure, I think it will be really, really interesting on how we're going to trust these new uh, platforms. Mm, okay, I have this other question. This, I think, could be an open question for all of you. Maybe, Anil, you want to go ahead. Um, I know you have really interesting um, thoughts on technology. So how do you think uh, these technologies um, can be leveraged to empower marginalized communities? Maybe it's not just for marginalized communities, also for like earthquake victims and uh, when it comes to natural disasters or something, because I uh, yeah, my roots come from Anatolia, so um, we had a very bad days, uh, bad moments actually last year uh, because of the earthquake in Turkey and Syria. So uh, I wasn't there, but I felt it in my heart. And the actually the organization in between the Web3 communities all over the world was amazing. I mean, uh, I mean, using that those blockchain technologies and NFTs and cryptocurrencies. So. Um, and it was, as I witnessed, the, uh, the global Web3 community is leading by Rafik Anadol. He's an um, yeah, international AI artist, uh, very global. Uh, he's been in uh, World Economic Forum in Davos actually a couple of weeks ago, and uh, he has just showed his uh, latest project, Data Land. It was about nature and AI. So, I mean, we are all thinking about, uh, I mean, how we can really, I mean, leverage all those technologies uh, with human intelligence, nature intelligence, and also artificial intelligence. I mean, which way we should look at uh, and uh, where should we start from sometimes? I mean, from our hearts, from our minds. So these are the basic questions that I've been also asking to myself uh, every day. When I teach, uh, when I work with the kids, uh, when I uh, play with them, or, uh, I mean, when I give a training to, to a company <laughs> about Web3 and AI. And, uh, I mean, before I go to bed, especially to myself. Uh, so, what, what you should choose, Anya, and what we should choose for a better world. And uh, and what can we be? What can it be done uh, with those amazing technologies? Because I always want to see the positive side. I mean, uh, rather than those challenges and uh, trust issues, of course, because this comes with the ethics to me. Uh, we are also, I mean, had the same problems in Web two, in and still we are having some problems, also ethical problems, trust issues. Uh, also in Web2, in social media platforms, this is this is all happening. So the the, the time hasn't changed. <laughs> I mean, we are still in the 21st century. <laughs> Nothing has changed actually. Uh, when we look at the, uh, uh, I mean, look at the challenges uh, comes from Web2, and uh, we are still living in it uh, with Web3. But I, I think it's uh, uh, it's mostly Web3 and AI can be used collaboratively for humanitarian purposes in various ways. For instance, AI can be used to analyze data, I mean, from Web3 networks to identify patterns and trends that can help uh, humanitarian organizations make informed decisions. So, uh, and AI can um, uh, also be used to develop predictive predictive models that can help forecast natural disasters and uh, other humanitarian crises, I think, allowing organizations to prepare and respond uh, more effectively. So, um, it, I mean, coming to, uh, I mean, marginalized also communities, which, uh, I mean, as a woman in tech, I, I can say that I'm a marginalized community <laughs> in between. <laughs> uh, I mean, in those tech industry, uh, because I remember that I was the only country manager in between 25 countries and, uh, and all um, the other men uh, and manners <laughs> around me. So, uh, 
I can't say that I was alone, but uh, whenever I see some heartfelt decisions that I see a woman also in that group. So uh, these things also uh, must be important to think that, I mean, to do the yin yang uh, of those communities and also women in tech and also women and men, uh, also, uh, I mean, all those marginalized groups, including kids, uh, I must say, um, to ask, <laughs> first of all, uh, to listen and, uh, and uh, the needs, uh, basically. Uh, from those communities. Uh, yeah. Well, amazing. And, um, I have seen these kind of um, benefits. Uh, recently in Bogota, we had a really big fire that uh, light up all the mountains that are very close to the city. And the, the response of, of everyone here was really, really quick. So I know the interconnectedness of um, our species can have really valuable um, responses towards these, not only marginalized communities, but also the uh, natural disasters that will start happening because of climate change. And uh, fortunately, we can start thinking about those solutions as well. Um, to close up our conversation, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the potential risks and how could they be mitigated by um, how we use the technology. Um, I, this is open question, so uh, feel free to jump in. <laughs> Sorry about that. Yes. So um, there's, you know, the obvious, you know, um, issues that I would say that we're dealing with now are not or will be probably again, you know, address that in the near future. I mean, do we realize how much information that we're giving, you know, just by the use of our credit card, you know, at a, at a store or, you know, the how, uh, you know, your government is, you know, uh, you know, reading your car meter and, you know, so all these things are kind of going on already. But, you know, as in, you know, having the ability to uh, control it is, you know, is something new with you know, the technologies that we have now that will kind of go into something like um, your personal agent and things like that. Or um, as technologies uh, increase, there'll be, you know, I'm willing to give you my name and phone number for access of this, or I'll be willing to give you all of my health information for free health care or kind of, you know, we'll kind of go in something in that direction. So again, it's going to be you know trusted and, and you know gone there. Uh, so as long as we it doesn't get abused, you know, like so if again I kind of go in with good you know uh, good you know positive attitudes and and you know expectations to kind of you know have that going back. Now, what happens? And this again another example with voice. I'm a big voice and sound person. Um, an example was um, um, I believe it happened with the brand Target. Uh, they were uh, they were able to pick up from the their voice act, uh, from their voice from the house voice assistant that someone was pregnant and started to change their um, the delivery of their coupons and other kind of you know other things like that you know when you know it was like hey all of a sudden I'm getting you know uh, diapers and this and that you know whatever and there was no you know. And that caused a bit of a, you know, again, of a, of a problem, you know, it was like, so what, you know, what are you even allowed to tell me, even if I don't know, or kind of, you know, things like that. So, uh, you know, um, again, uh, having them all into, I think, ultimately, um, you know, into a place where you are in 100% control, uh, that will be, you know, I, I guess, I, I, allow the, you know, the trust levels, you know, to, you know, to kind of go in there, um, you know, and take it to the next level. Yes, and um, data is a new currency now, right? Because uh, uh, AI models are trained on data, and this data we gather, we gather it from people that are subscribing to these platforms for free. And when it's free, you are the product. And uh, this is something that I learned um, at doing uh, my master's in Silicon Valley. Because, um, you know, the business students, we are now kind of 
um, we have our mind more open towards these platform businesses. And uh, because of the data is the new currency, then these platforms are uh, very powerful for that uh, gathering and centralization of data. But I was uh, recently reading a book called Who Owns the Future? And they are talking about what if we start monetizing people's data um, and paying them for uh, that data they're giving to the platform and not um, just providing them free products or services. And I thought mm -hmm. it's really, really interesting. And I haven't seen many companies doing that recently. But um, there are uh, um, uh, web browser companies, you know, again, since there is that interaction, you know, where they'll, you know, you'll be able to get, you know, micro pennies or, you know, some advantages, you know, of that. It's been on the, you know, a development list for many of the uh, companies, um, uh, you know, when you sign up for their programs, you know, you know, the, again, you're kind of allowing them, you know, to, you know, to for benefits, the hotel, you know, points and things like that. There's a thing there. But uh, if I can go into one other example, um, and again, uh, kind of trying to mitigate this down, there are, uh, you know, the the excitement of Web3 um, technologies, you know, both today and tomorrow, there are, and as, as again, using some examples of today for tomorrow, the, um, the uh, personal identification company Clear, which we all may be familiar with at the airports and stuff, they kind of, it's like another, you know, level and, um, you know, if you can take those, like, and right there, that's a global, international, accepted level. First time I've ever seen anything like that, whether you're either reading your uh, eye retina or, uh, or your, uh, I think it's either your voice or your face. I'm not sure where you go from there. Uh, as um, Jonas mentioned, if we can get that more of the, kind of in the blockchain level, you know, where we can, now it's going to be open to everyone, you know, the ability for you know for everyone to you know tap into and it'll you know make does it make a difference you know where you go and uh, again where you are this that if you can recognize who you are and i need help or i need this or that um you know it could be a much better quicker humanitarian aspect versus you know waiting for the un to you know drop something on you know in your neighborhood or something yeah, I totally, <clears throat> I totally agree. Um, I think uh, just uh, one or two sentences, sentences on that. Um, I think um, what here um, is really important that we educate. Um, so, I mean, everybody's talking about like, we need to educate, we need to educate. But um, in the end, it, it comes down to that, right? Um, I mean, if we want to be, um, or if you want to have more um, uh, so then, um, data security um, and um, basically, if we want to be more sensitive to what we are doing with our data, uh, we need to educate people and we need to make everyone aware um, that you are giving your data away basically for free every day. Um, and if we can then maybe apply Web3 to, to that and then maybe somehow monetize your data, then um, this entire game changes because then also the incentives changes. Um, and I think we need to think uh, into, into that direction. Um, and that's basically all the the, um, the uh, ground work for that is basically um, done by NFTs. That's basically um, why there's so much um, hope on, on NFTs. I mean, nobody's like talking about NFTs at the moment, but basically that's the underlying technology um, to, to realize that. Wow, awesome comment, Jonas. Thank you so much. I don't know, Daniel, do you want to um, close up uh, for this question and then yep. sure sure uh, definitely something which we didn't touch base is the compliance so for instance we are working in the sphere with being a uh, fda compliant and, and let's say HIPAA compliant is very is very important so uh, because we're dealing with people that work with different trauma and stuff of course they're usually requiring like like I like if FDA compliant, do you have any other compliance certificates, do you have any research studies and stuff? So um, even for the other startups, so even for the companies that are jumping here uh, to this industry, web free AI, uh, thinking of the compliance when you're building your <laughs> financials and, 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 and budgets, it's very important. So think twice, <laughs> think twice. <laughs> yes, definitely. 
Well, thank you all. Anil, Richard, Jonas, Daniel, this was a fantastic conversation. Um, I learned so much. Hope to see you uh, again and, and connect soon. Uh, have a good day. Yeah, thanks everyone. Thanks a lot. See you soon. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Bye.